accessing library computer data. Out there, there are no saints, just people. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. We are continuing our run-through of Star Trek to Deep Space Nine. Right now we're up to the episode called Defiant. It is the ninth episode of the third season, directed by Cliff Bowl, written by Ronald D. Moore. Uh, it aired back on November 21st, 1994. In this episode, when Commander William T. Riker from the Enterprise-D arrives on DS9, he takes a liking to Kira, who gives him a tour of the Defiant. But Riker is revealed to not be who he claims to be when he attacks Kira and steals the Defiant. So uh, we are about to talk about the episode Defiant, which features one of our favorite characters from TNG who's coming back to the show. We've got a couple guests here. Clay, welcome back. How are you? I'm good. I'm really happy. I, I couldn't have been happier at the beginning of this episode, where uh, apparently... Riker has a sense that anytime there's a uh, a woman looking to relax, it's like his bat signal, and he just appears. Yeah, <laughs> he's just fantastically shot as well. It's like Bashir and Quark literally walk out the door, presumably having walked past the strange man loitering in the doorway, leering kind of awkwardly. <laughs> and it's like, no, R- Riker chooses to be visible at that moment. It's like, yep. The other voice you hear is Darren. Darren, welcome Sorry. to the no, it's no problem. Welcome to the show. If uh, you want to introduce yourself, you're the first time. Uh, this is your first time on the show. Maybe not the last, but it's certainly the first time. So, if you want to introduce yourself, it would be appreciated. Oh, perfect. Uh, my name is is Darren Mooney. I'm a writer, blogger, critic, uh, pop culture pundit type person. Um, I write online uh, for the movie blog. I write for various publications, including Cinearin, which is Ireland's leading uh, monthly cinematic magazine. And I've also published a book on the X-Files. Uh, and as part of my online blogging, I've actually reviewed a lot of the Star Trek output. So a lot of the, all of the original series, uh, some of the next generation, all of Deep Space Nine, most of Voyager and all of Enterprise uh, in the very weird way that I'm doing it. Um, I may have prioritized the parts that I like and saved the next generation, which I love for the very end. <laughs> as my reward when I get to the end of Voyager. It's like, if I just get through these final two seasons, then I can watch The Next Generation. So to give people a sense of your, uh, wh- why don't you rank the series for us for your own personal rankings? Uh, Deep Space Nine would, would come out very much on top, probably Next Generation second, uh, then probably uh, TOS, uh, then uh, then Enterprise, then a sizable gap in Voyager, actually. I don't want to rank Discovery yet because we are literally only one season into it. Okay. All right, cool. Well, guys, I'm, I'm thank you very much for coming on the show. We're going to take a break. I'm going to play an audio clip. Me, Darren, and Clay are going to come back, and we're going to break down Defiant. You're really not cut out for this, are you? Being a terrorist, I mean. You're not very good at it. Really? You're acting more like a Starfleet officer who's more interested in intelligence reports and Cardassian politics than in actually hurting Cardassians. You have one of the most powerful ships in this quadrant under your command. Why aren't you out attacking every Cardassian outpost along the border? Because these stakes are far greater than border outposts. Not for the Maquis. They're not because the Maquis are terrorists. And the only thing terrorists care about is attacking the enemy. I know I was a terrorist, and if I'd had this ship then... I would have destroyed Deep Space Nine. I would have hit the Cardassians so hard they would have screamed for peace, but I certainly wouldn't have gone flying off into the middle of Cardassia on some wild goose chase. I guess we're different kinds of terrorists. No. You're trying to be a hero. Terrorists don't get to be heroes. We'll see. Clay, I'd mentioned this. Uh, I'd mentioned that Tom Riker makes an appearance in DS9. I don't remember if you actually remembered it. And Darren, for your uh, information, Clay has never actually seen Deep Space Nine. He's, he's seen a couple episodes, but he hasn't seen uh, the entire thing. It's sort of a new experience for him. So I use him as a sounding board to let us know what he thought about certain things. But um, Clay, Tom Riker's back. How do you feel about it? Uh, I have. Never seen a more um, hilarious reveal than when uh, he takes off half of his beard. (laughs) (laughs) I have never seen anybody take off half a fake beard as a reveal. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, he goes with the uh, he goes with the, it turns it into the evil goatee, right? Which is sort of his uh, yeah. the trademark there at that point. It's a, it's a, I think the reaction to that is very split. I don't know. I I sort of enjoy it on like a campy terrible level, but I think uh-huh. I, I think on a real level it's not very good. Yeah, I it's pretty silly. I mean, I the uh, the, the way that they handle him at the beginning overall is very much uh it feels very tongue in cheek from you know like I said about his uh uh magically appearing when there's a a woman looking to, looking to let loose um to the next scene where Kira just assumes I mean I'm sorry Dax just assumes that Kira slept with Riker right <laughs> it's a safe bet you- um, I get, you know, it's, it, but, but it is, it is silly, but it's like, I guess it's the only way you can do that without straight up saying it's Tom Riker. I guess. I don't know. I, that's going to be a hard thing to get across visually because it's the same guy, but, um, I guess taking off half a beard is, is one way to get across that it's not Riker and it's not a fake Riker. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, second chances had been one of my favorite TNG episodes. I think it's like one of the most underrated episodes of the show. It's one that's never listed on like a top TNG episodes, but I think it's really, really super strong for TNG. Mm-hmm. Came in their one of their best seasons. Uh, Darren, I don't know if you wanted to connect the dots. If you if you wanted to sort of connect second chances to this and how you think it. Um, we'll just sort of get into the the main point. I think here is that this is a very DS9 take on a TNG idea and it's a yeah. it's a mirroring of the TNG universe except it takes place in the DS9 universe and I think that it's uh interesting for that reason but what what do you think well, I mean the, the the fascinating one of the great things about um the Star Trek franchise and particularly like the the Burman era one of the fascinating things to watch is the way in which the 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 franchise sort of deals with the legacy of the next generation because again this is something that's very hard to get a sense of like from from the perspective of now you know when everything's streaming and everybody's you know everybody's formed an opinion and everything's all over and the dust has settled but like the next generation was an absolutely huge deal in the early 90s it was this huge cultural force it was something that everybody was watching everybody was talking about you know back when there were only so many channels and this was obviously tng was in first run syndication but it was absolutely everywhere everybody was aware of it it was one of the first science fiction shows to get a proper like uh, outstanding drama series nomination at the emmys in its final season which deep space nine may or may not affectionately mock during its third season but you have basically a cast this huge shadow uh, over the course of like over obviously the television landscape, but also over the shows that followed, because every Star Trek show, or at least the Berman era Star Trek shows, maybe Discovery's gotten out of that shadow because it's been so long. But like Deep Space Nine, Voyager, Enterprise, all had to exist in relation to TNG because TNG was the show that revived the franchise. It defined what Star Trek was in the eighties and going into the nineties, and it also gave it you know a lot of the the great writers, uh, the producers, obviously Rick Berman overseeing it. So they all had a very sort of a common genealogy that you can trace backwards. And so you have this interesting dichotomy in how the shows uh, approach, uh, you know, obviously the the legacy of the next generation. I don't know if you've watched Voyager or Enterprise. I don't want to spoil too much of it, but Voyager and Enterprise have this weirdly like referential approach to TNG, where it's almost like a holy relic, where it's like they want to touch part of TNG and hold part of TNG. And it happens repeatedly on Voyager, where despite the fact they're in the middle of nowhere in the Delta Quadrant, they'll bump into something from TNG. Like, yep. they do a straight-up cameo from, like, it's legitimately William Riker at one point in Voyager. At another point, they have, like, Barkley pop up a couple of times, and Deanna Troy and Geordie LaForge, they all pop over. And every time they pop over, it's like, oh my god, isn't it great? It's like your favorite aunt and uncle's visiting. And obviously, Enterprise, despite being a prequel series, has its own big, complicated relationship with TNG that becomes it's the this, the only like, episode of Enterprise I've ever watched. <laughs> Is the finale? Oh, fantastic. The finale, yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so you know exactly what I'm talking about there. There's mm-hmm. this weird referential where Enterprise, like, it's been running for four years, but it relies on the presence of Riker and Troy in order to validate its very existence. Uh, which is this awkward dynamic relationship that, like, Voyager and Enterprise have with TNG. And one of the great things about Deep Space Nine, one of the things I adore about Deep Space Nine, is that it's very much like the rebellious middle sibling when it comes to its relationship with TNG. Mm. Where there's a sense of, like, Okay, okay, Gramps. You know, I think um, Ira Bear described TNG as the Connecticut of the Star Trek universe and that it's populated <laughs> by people who are generally pleasant, uh, who are well-meaning, and who you don't really have any ill will towards. But for Bear, they're also kind of a little bit boring. 
So yeah. you have things like Bear will, as showrunner, and, and he becomes showrunner in the third season, will re- re- repeatedly sort of thumb his nose at the next generation. There's a variety of ways of doing it. I don't want to spoil any of the great stuff that's coming up, but you can kind of see in the way that it relates to the next generation, there's always a bit of a, a bit of a cheeky sort of like winky nod to it. It's like there's like having O'Brien describe Cisco as the best captain in the fleet, wink, wink, just so you know how we consider ourselves to fall in this particular ranking. But, but even here, for example, where you have William Riker show up and it's almost a parody of William Riker. It's like, oh my God, he's so sexy. He's so hot. He's got like this woman needs to relax radar that just sort of pinged and like magically drew him to quarks. Um, like, and, and then everyone's all like, oh, Dax. Dax is like, oh, did you sleep with him? And when he shows up and when, O'Bri- you know, Cisco's like, oh, would you like to come and have dinner with me and Jake? We'd really love to have you. It'd be fantastic. Um, and then you have even that bit with O'Brien where, like, he's like, oh, I think you know what you did, O'Brien. And O'Brien's like, yes, I know. Wait a, wait a minute. Yeah, uh, th- but by the time then that happens and he pulls off the beard, it's like, OK, what you thought was going to be a big lovey-dovey next generation tribute act is basically this weird story about a twin brother who's trying to define his own identity. Uh, with transporter duplicates, terrorists, and Cardassians. It's like, okay, Deep Space Nine's doing its own thing. Yeah, it's a... It's, well, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll throw it to you, Clay, yeah. after I say this. The the opening before they steal the Defiant here is the the dichotomy between the cheesiness of the opening and what actually happens in the episode right up to the ending where Riker is... Uh, the tragedy of, of Tom Riker is to be tortured to death, basically, in a labor <laughs> camp for the rest of his life. Um, the... <laughs> The cheesiness of the opening is, to me, feels like a direct homage to TNG. It's DS9 sort of like saying, like, this is the comfortable atmosphere of TNG. We're going to trick you into thinking that this is Will Riker. Everyone's very comfortable. We're flirting. We're having drinks at Cork's Bar. And then it it flips itself. And the episode would have been terrible if it had stuck with the tone of those first opening acts, I think. It would have been sort of like a Rivals-esque episode where it's like this goofy, maybe semi-comedy type thing of a dating Kira and, and uh, Riker. But it turns around on it, and I think it uses Riker really well in the sense that it is Riker and it's not Riker. Like, he is... The the Tom's identity crisis is the kind of identity crisis that DS9 is showing to have when it's comparing itself to TNG on some level, like you were saying. Well, Clay, I interrupted you. What were you going to do? Oh, I, I was just going to ask. Um, the That thing that happens between Riker and O'Brien, is that something that we should know about? Is that something that I missed? No. Like, why why, no, seems- why does he have that My- negative... My understanding is he does it because he needs O'Brien to get off the defiant and he knows that O'Brien being subservient to him won't question what he's talking about. I think okay, I right. think that's what they're doing. Yeah. You get a really good reaction shot of O'Brien as he's leaving the defiant as if to say, wait, wait, what, what just happened? Uh, but then he continues <laughs> walking. Uh, I actually like that there are a number of cues early on in the episode during that like Tom Riker sequence where... Uh, Frakes, you know, and again, I, I really like Frakes. He has a wonderful charisma. He's got like this wonderful charm that he plays really well. I love Riker. But Frakes was never really the strongest sort of dramatic actor, I think, in the TNG cast. But he gets these really nice moments early on where you can tell when a character like recognizes him as Riker, where Tom is basically going, OK, how do I improvise my way out of the situation? You have this like almost blue screen of death moment. It happens very briefly when Dax is like, oh, I hope you haven't forgot that you owe me money. And Riker's like, oh, crap. Uh, and then she goes, oh, by the way, just remember you, you borrowed three strips of Latin off. And he's like, oh, yes, I remember that. He, he's also almost caught again. in a lie there because Cisco, he had lied to Cisco about how successful he had been before, I think. Right. I think that's a conflict. I think they're talking yeah. about the same episode. You know, honestly, I didn't even catch that that as a the Dax thing as him having to think on his feet because I get my my initial reaction was, oh, he I thought it was one of those things where Dax was somebody else when this thing happened you know what i mean and that sh- they hadn't jumped into the new body yet yeah yeah um yep. it didn't even occur to me that that was just something that he had to uh make up i think it is they don't overplay it but that's my reading of it is no, that i think she, you're right she's mis- she's saying that what you just described to cisco actually happened differently because tom's understanding of what will, will Riker did is a very idealized bigger brother <laughs> thing yeah. mm-hmm that's the other thing that I thought was a little bit strange is the, some of the stuff that he was talking about, I guess if he's making it up as he goes, then that's fine. But uh, the stuff that he's talking about, he why would he know that stuff? Because it would, like, he, he wouldn't have been on Deep Space Nine before he got split into two people, right? 
Well, the when does does Darren? You might know this. He does. He, Riker goes to DS Nine earlier than Second Chances happens. I think right. Um, it would presumably be around Birthright, which is the two parter yeah. where they dock at Deep Space Nine and have the crossover with Bashir. And I mean that that's I think what Riker references again. In the seventh season, there are episode with a cameo from Quark where he makes yep. a reference to the money that he owes. Oh, I so guess I, I, I guess my 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 thought was, if Tom Riker was in basically a cave for like fifteen years, right? Yes. Yeah. So is his experiences on Deep Space Nine prior to that, or is no, he no, just he like would have, no, no, no. they would have found? So Riker would have gone to DS Nine before the episode where they meet Tom Riker. So you could assume that he told him about it. I guess would be would the way, be the way sure. that you could get okay. a, you could get a, it seems <laughs> it seems a random thing for him to tell him. But he, he seem, maybe he's uh you know this is this is Star Trek. They're always reading each other's logs nonstop. So maybe he did a little bit of a reconnaissance on him. Yeah, I mean it's not a big deal. It's just something that kind of threw me a little bit when they did that switch. I was like, how how would he know all that stuff? But whatever. They're connected. They're I feel connected. Like that stuff is very in Riker's character, and I actually kind of like the idea that like Tom Riker is, as you pointed out, doing the like romanticized Big Brother thing, where he's he's telling the version of events that you know Will Riker either probably told him or probably entered in his log, or the version that he knows that Will Riker would tell if he went to Deep Space Nine, no matter what happened. Which is, yeah. Oh, by the way, I totally dated a Dabo girl and won all the money, and then Dax is like, actually, what happened was, yeah. 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 No, I can, I can, I can see him. I mean, he's not going to go there without any, without doing any research too. So I'm sure he could. There are records of him being there and all that kind of stuff. So I'm sure he could piece it together. Yeah. Tom is. Um. Tom's obviously on a mission to go there. I don't know if he expected Kira to be the way that he would get in. Um. I don't really get that impression because he doesn't pursue her too strongly. He's either got the long con in a factor. He's uh, not particularly interested in that sort of like specific of an action. But he gets onto the Defiant. Um, unless you guys have something else to talk about the Tom thing, but I think that the Defiant is where the episode really starts because it splits off Cisco and Dukat, and then it splits off uh, Riker on the Defiant with Kira. And I think that the, you know, I, w- I was saying it's a reflection of the TNG thing because I think this episode actually pairs with the Maquis episode, Clay, if you remember that one, the two-parter that we did a little while ago. Um, I'm aware of it. The the episode I I <laughs> the episode there where Cisco has the friend who joins the Maquis and he sort of mm-hmm. betrays Starfleet. Yep. The, the what they're doing is kind of a similar story, except that Tom Riker reflects Will Riker sort of a hundred percent. Like the show's taking a little bit of liberty with saying that this is basically Will Riker because Tom Riker never Tom Riker never changes out of his uniform. Right in the in the Maquis, the big turn is when the guy joins the Maquis. He puts on the loose fitting vest that signifies right. you are no longer <laughs> with Starfleet. <laughs> um, and in this episode, he keeps Riker keeps his uniform on the entire time because this Riker is the TNG universe on this DS9 episode. He's not a good terrorist, right? He is. Mm-hmm. He's trying to do the right thing. Tom Riker has an identity crisis issue where he doesn't know what he wants to be. So he's sort of done his teenage rebellion years when he's 45 or whatever he is. And he's joined the Maquis and he doesn't know why. And I love the contrast there of Kira yelling at him about what it takes to be a terrorist and him, him being like, I'm going to be a hero at the end of the story. He is a hero at the end because they tie it up with a TNG type success story that's moderated by a little DS9 darkness. But um, I just like that contrast there. I don't, I don't know what you thought about the insertion of Riker into the DS9 universe, Clay. Um, yeah, no, I, uh, I thought it was really good. I thought the, the back and forth he has with Kira, the, uh, um, the terrorism speech that they have is really good. Um, I don't know if I'd go so far as to say he's the hero at the end. Um, hero of his own story. Yeah, I guess I don't know. I, the, I kind of had a bit of a problem with the ending, not the not the way that it it shook out because it seemed to shake out naturally, but it was just I don't know. It seemed like too too easy of a of a wrap up for me. Um, but yeah, I, I I think that I I think the the strongest points of the episode for me were the the two scenes where you've got people kind of debating, um, not debating, but just discussing the two sides of the of, of the war that they're currently in, which is not something that you get a ton. Um, I mean, you get it a lot in, in Deep Space Nine, but it's 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 always nice to have two sides of uh, of the point of view that are uh, get get to coexist. Like the the other scene being uh, 
even though it's very short, the the Ducat talking about his son's birthday. I thought that was great. I thought that back and forth was really good, and I really liked the uh, the Kira thing about terrorism. Um, yeah, and Riker Riker's a, is an interesting choice for this, obviously, because I mean, you can do it because Tom Riker is out there. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but also as a character to choose to be this uh, sort of. Um, what's the word for it? Uh, he, Kira kind of points it out, I think, that he is a terrorist, but he doesn't think of himself as a terrorist, and that is very much the way I feel like Riker would handle it, where he is, he believes he's doing the right thing. Um, well, he's also but, being a little bit, he's being grandiose in his plans, because he's like, I'm going to go in, get all the information, and get out of there. And she's saying what a true terrorist would do would basically go in there and suicide bomb whatever is right. going on in there. And that's the that's the Starfleet. That's why he can't get out of the uniform, because Riker's always going to be that guy, that character. Right. He's, I mean, he's more or less trying to do a, a, a tactical, uh, you know, excision. I don't know if that's the word, right word to use. Uh Whereas, yeah, a terrorist would just be like, I'm going to cause the largest amount of damage possible as quickly as possible. That's not what he's about. Yep. Darren. Yeah, I mean, I... I oh, sorry. No, I was going to jump ahead. in there and, and just say that, that there's also something very, very Will Riker about this. Because if you look at the, the Next Generation, I think the better William Riker-centric episodes, and I'm thinking here of, say, the best of both worlds, I'm also thinking of Second Chances, are episodes that basically take what the original series Bible said about Riker, which is he's the Maverick Kirk type figure. He's the more dynamic leader to Picard's sort of like, you know, sort of stoic Vulcan-esque leader, uh, which never really played out. It never really sort of, we never really sold this idea of Riker as like a devil may care sort of character outside of all the terrible first season episodes where he's like, okay, I desperately want to have sex. Let's bring Wesley down to the planet with the draconian laws. Um, but right. outside of that, Riker generally tended to be like this very stoic, very sort of reason, very like he was he was friendly, he was polite, but he was never really a maverick. And despite the fact that he saw himself as a maverick and despite the fact that he saw himself as somebody who, th who thought outside the box, Riker was actually just generally a reasonably competent like second first officer. He was a guy who could follow orders reasonably well and who could like deliver professionally on what was required. And like there's always this tension in the, in the next generation, particularly in say the best of both worlds or second chances, where Riker is confronted with the reality that he's not He's not the rogue that he thinks he is. He's actually mm. just a solid middle management type. And I feel like there's an element of that in Defiant, where Tom Riker is basically getting that compressed sort of character development, where it's like, okay, you think you're a badass, like, free spirit, like, rogue, who's going to run off, join a terrorist organization, save the entire Alpha Quadrant, because you don't play by anybody's rules but your own. And Kira's like... Actually, you're, you're you're actually just exactly like your brother. You're stuck in your ways. You have this very sort of structured, rational way of thinking about things. You have a lot of predefined notions about how you see the universe. And your self-image doesn't reflect who you personally are, which is a very nice sort of bit of characterization, a very nice touch, you know? And that's that's kind of something that I think we talked about a little bit when we were doing TNG, Wes, is, is that, you know, the one thing that keeps coming back to Riker is how people comment about how he doesn't have his own ship and how he's not a captain and how blah, 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 blah. And he always ends up take dipping his toe outside of his comfort zone and then just falling back into this, you know, second in command position. And whether that originated as uh, a byproduct of the episodic nature of the show where everything needs to reset at the end, it turns into a character trait at a certain point. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's it's always been interesting because I think you're exactly right, Darren. That he 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 doesn't he the actual uh, um, content of his actions don't necessarily back up his his own uh, uh, self self. What's the word? Uh, his like image or image? Yeah, yeah, self image. Yes, yeah, yeah. He's Riker is. I always think of Riker as basically a slightly more action oriented and more friendly with the crew version of Picard. And I think maybe he just developed that. You could say maybe the character was sort of limp learning from his mentor as he developed that that would be the way that he would go. He's he's more affable than Picard was with sort of strangers, but he's, as you say, Darren, he's middle management through and through uh, to the point here where Tom Riker uh, is... We'll, we'll take it for granted that Tom Riker is basically supposed to be Will Riker because he is. We always get into the weird sort of metaphysical uh, when you talk about Tom Riker as to what he actually is. I was thinking that 
Tom Riker is maybe the most tragic character in Star Trek. <laughs> like he is imagine <laughs> imagine you have this accident happen to you, right? And you be you go down to a planet and you're trying to help people. You beam out, there's an accident, and you get stuck back on the planet. You do re- you don't realize what's happened. Six years later they come back and they say, No, the real you came back. You are a fake you. Like you you are not the real <laughs> you. You are some other version. And everyone treats you as if you're not really you. And then you haven't developed anything. You haven't, your brother, your older clone has been out getting laid and getting promoted, not to a captain, but he's happy where he is. He's happy to be there. And you've just been on this planet. And then you are so empty of identity that you join a terrorist organization that doesn't really seem particularly well run at this point in the franchise. (laughs) And then you end up in a labor camp for the rest of your life. Like, is there a sadder character in Star Trek? It's hard to, hard to say. I'll double down on that and I'll say like the the really sad thing about like Riker or about Tom Riker is right he spends all those years alone on the cave uh, on the planet thinking about all the great things that he would have done if he'd not been stuck on that planet for all that time be like oh I'll be captain by now I'll be like fleet captain by now I'll be admiral by now people will be saying my name I'll have made a different in the cosmos and then he finally gets out and he discovers he was actually only ever going to be middle management yeah. um, that's that's the real tragedy of Tom Riker um but yeah I think you're right and I actually think you sort of hit on something interesting with the maquis there like the maquis there's an interesting sort of dichotomy or sort of in the way that the Star Trek franchise approaches the maquis because the maquis like they're obviously they're introduced to the next generation you guys have watched the next generation together I'm assuming have you yep yep mm-hmm cool so they're introduced in the next generation and then they sort of they go on and they sort of branch and you get two branches you get the maquis as they're developed on voyager uh because obviously they were a huge part of voyager's mythology to the point where they're like reverse engineered on deep space nine and the next generation in order to set up voyager and voyager carries on with its maquis characters you know it doesn't do much with them but it has its, its own idea of what they're supposed to be and deep space nine is it's basically stuck and i think the writers have talked about this how they literally got landed with the maquis as their own little bit of continuity that they had to deal with despite the fact that it was only done to launch voyager and you have this interesting approach to the maquis on deep space nine which is different from what you see in the next generation and voyager because on the next generation voyager there's something very noble about the maquis the maquis are like they're people who are dispossessed they're people who are like fighting they're native to, americans like, in the tng episode that, like they're they're literally yeah. native americans who are fighting back for their homeland that's it exactly and on deep space nine repeatedly and i mean repeatedly and and this isn't a spoiler but like of the two episodes you've watched so far they are middle-aged men having midlife crises and deciding to become <laughs> terrorists. This is like the Star Trek equivalent of buying a Ferrari. And trust me, the Deep Space Nine doesn't get that much more like nuanced or sympathetic towards the Maquis as it goes. And that's why Kira's big speech to Riker is so good. It's because it's like, look, you guys are still thinking like Starfleet officers. The Maquis are really, really terrible terrorists. And this came up in the Maquis two-parter where they have Dukat. And Dukat's like, look, if you guys were an any way competent terrorists i would be singing to you right now but you're kind of crap at this aren't you yeah and it's sort of like i really there's something very interesting in deep space science approach to the maquis as compared to how they were set up on on next generation i mean do you think that that's do you think that's intentional because what i love about the maquis is i love that they represent that starfleet did something that harmed federation citizens and it's like a it's a starfleet as me and Clay talked about in the search, it's Starfleet is willing to give up so much in order to maintain this sort of status quo of peace between people that it's willing to sacrifice its own citizens to people. And I, the idea of the Maquis is really interesting. It's funny that they never really, they never really develop into anything that is like a spectacular threat or like its own sort of standalone, like this is where the story is about. They're always on the periphery. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm curious about that because it's you would, you would suspect that, like, based on Deep Space Nine's politics and its premise, which is like obviously it's dealing with the legacy of colonialism on Bajor and the, the horrors inflicted on the Bajorans by the Cardassians, you would imagine the show would have a like a large amount of sympathy for the Maquis, and it does at certain points. It's sort of vaguely sympathetic to them, but on the other hand, there's this weird recurring sort of almost contempt. I'd describe it for the Maquis because they've chosen violence it seems to be it seems to be like that seems to be the moral weight that deep space nine puts on the maquis and that's sort of like what you see with quark who is like and again quark is like deep space nine's voice of humanism whenever like the deep space nine writers and particularly iris even bear want to make a point 
to the audience about what the episode is actually about morally speaking there's a tendency to put that in Quark's mouth and you'll see that later on obviously in the seventh season which is just a wonderful touch and it kind of I, I admire that Deep Space Nine does something as weird as that but you have Quark having this big conversation about how like this violence and terrorism is actually kind of pointless because all it's going to do is just cause more harm and Kira makes the same point here which is like the Maquis stealing the Defiant and running off into Cardassian space is just going to lead to the Cardassians sending bucket loads of ships into the demilitarized zone escalating the carnage to the point of war and causing more suffering in the long term and it's very interesting because of how deep space nine approaches the idea of terrorism and freedom fighting because there's this there is a sense in deep space nine's worldview that there is a difference between the two that they're not all entangled romantically that like what bajor did and what bajor does is perfectly justifiable legal and reasonable and fair and the episode and like kira is is one of the episodes one of the characters that the show like really venerates and really respects because she did this sort of stuff and she did it to protect her homeland on the other hand deep space nine seems to have a contempt for characters who are who are willing to do that stuff just to do it. And this is the thing, I think, with the difference between how Next Generation and how Deep Space Nine approached the Maquis, because Next Generation does treat them as indigenous people. It treats them as Native Americans. You're entirely right in Journey's End with Wesley Crusher um, going there and sort of discovering his, like, having his college gap year, basically, yeah. Um, yeah. on this Native American planet in this sort of Michael Pillar likes Native American sort of trapping sort of way. <laughs> Whereas Deep Space Nine uh, kind of is more along the lines of, well, look, these planets were probably settled by you. None of these people are actually indigenous. None of these people, you know, that you could move in the same way that your ancestors moved, or you, you could accept the peace. That's the choice that you make. You don't get to run around, gallivant, shoot weapons, and cause war because you feel like some sort of existential un unrest. And, like, there's a sense that the Maquis in, in Deep Space Nine are, like, you're right when you say they're an extension of Starfleet in there, and the point where various characters wearing their Starfleet uniforms, because it's like, DC-9 seems very sceptical of Starfleet and the Federation as institutions. You point out the lengths that they will go to in order to secure peace, the sacrifices that they're willing to make, the compromises that they're willing to make, and the fact that there, there's a sense of like listlessness and anxiety. And repeatedly over the course of the, the show, there's this suggestion that Starfleet is having its own sort of identity crisis over the like seven years of the show that's different from like on The Next Generation where Picard discovers that an evil admiral is doing a weapons deal or something like that as happens repeatedly. It's more like there's a fundamental rot, a fundamental sense of like existential uncertainty, like a what is the whole point of this thing that we're doing? What is it like to be a hero? And and the Maquis become like a channel for this. It's As I said, it's like the midlife crisis of a Starfleet officer on Deep Space Nine is to go become a terrorist for a little while. And, and Deep Space Nine is like, no, that's that's not cool at all. <laughs> you know, I, I, don't, I don't think I realized, because um, I, I don't from I don't think I saw the the TNG episode with the Maquis. I, I don't I don't ex explicitly remember it. Um, I don't think I did, you did. Yeah, I don't know. think you did. Um, but it's interesting to see that change because I wonder I I I feel like the disdain towards them that you're talking about must be rooted in the fact that they switch them to be less of an indigenous group and more of basically yeah. a Starfleet offshoot because that makes sense to me in that uh, what's happening with Bajorans and if the Maquis, Maquis were originally an, uh, an indigenous population, like you were saying, that's all, that's all instances in which this conflict was projected onto a people um, who didn't ask for it, and therefore their uh, rebellion against it becomes uh, uh, noble. But in the case that they're handling it now, it is very much... It is a uh, consequence of Starfleet's own actions that this is happening. Um, so the rebellion is, is, is much less noble than if it were uh, uh, a indigenous people. And it's, it's, I, I, had, I didn't realize that. That's a really interesting... Uh, change, and yeah. uh, I wonder. It, it it makes it. It it's really interesting in that that's how. It's kind of the only way that. Well, no, I was gonna say it's kind of it's kind of a the only way that you could present a terrorist organization inside the uh, um, supposed. Uh, um, like ut he, utopian, yeah, utopian kind of Star Starfleet. Trek ideal, and uh, and and have it have it work as if it's a direct result of of what 
Starfleet has done. And I, I didn't realize that. And that's that's actually pretty interesting. I mean, I think that the I, I think that the way that they develop them is more interesting than the TNG version of it, which is the, the I would in, say so too. The indigenous yeah. thing. Yeah. Like the the confusion about what the Maquis are in this goes hand in hand with the confusion that DS9 seems to think, as Darren was saying, about what Starfleet's identity is. So it's more mm-hmm. it's more symbolic of that kind of uh, broken system. And the just the like uh, we had talked earlier, Clay, about like I, I thought they actually did a good job with the Maquis because they gave them in a world where you can have everything. The Maquis are fighting for the symbolism of home. Like this is really the right. only thing that the Maquis can fight for in a world where you could just literally move to a new planet and replicate everything to be exactly the same that you wanted. Mm-hmm. The it's really just the idea of you can't fucking push me around anymore like this is that's the what the only thing left that you have to stand for are these kind of like conflicts between the groups that don't agree with federation values so i i, I think that that's something that ds9 goes into and is interested in doing and the change to the maquis makes sense there mm. uh let's see here so let's talk about the cardassian order or the obsidian order and the cardassian central command uh it's not our first time on cardassia but we get a lot of ducats in this one clay did you uh, did you notice anything I'm not, this is not a trick question. I'm just kind of curious what you thought about Ducats in this episode. He's so skinny. That actor is so skinny. Every time they show him from the side, it's like, oh my God, his neck is huge and he is so skinny. When you see him from the front, he looks like a pretty well-built person because of the way that that costume works, which I think if you look at it from any other angle is preposterous. Mm-hmm. But uh, um, man, that is a skinny actor. No, I, 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 I thought he was... I thought he was great. I, I'm, I'm, I really like Ducat. I like that. Uh, you know, I, I was, I was wondering if you have the Cardassians who are every single one of them is always kind of like riding the line between trustworthy and untrustworthy, and uh, will help you and will screw you. I was wondering if that would get overwhelming, where it's like if you've got three Cardassians in an episode, which one is the one who's supposed to be the good guy or, you know, that, that kind of thing. It just gets too complicated. Um, but I, I really liked the, uh, the setup with the obsidian order. And, uh, if that's, if, if that's the way they are to a person riding the line between, uh, being honest and being deceitful, it makes sense that the government would be the same way where they would have this this entire subset, which is actually much more powerful than anybody had any idea of even the people who are supposedly in the same government. Um, I, I did wonder at the end if Ducat was, was giving, I don't know if that deal was as sweet as he seemed to make it. Um, for who? For, for himself. Uh, because he seems to give away a lot of shit for, uh, for not much, especially giving back the, the Defiant, which is like the best weapon they have at, at Deep Space Nine at that time. Well, um, he, get, he gets the information that he's going to use to screw over the Obsidian Order, potentially. True, yeah. Yeah, I think I think it's consistent in um shit, what the the I can't remember the there was one episode we watched recently that I really liked where he has a uh the one where he gets framed for something. Ducat gets anyway. framed. Ducat. Yeah. Uh anyway, it, it it's consistent in his way of where he's going to toe the company line, but he is not gonna do it. To oh, is this the Maquis two parter where it he's, might be, he yeah, goes yeah. to the museum? He goes, sorry, he goes to the military zone to investigate with yeah, Cisco. That maybe that's it. I can't remember exactly. But it, it's consistent with the way that he will he will tow the company line until it no longer uh benefits him to do so, but he will never reject the company. He will just find a way to benefit himself and reposition himself inside it. Yeah. The, and it fits that with the, is the an astonishingly good character read. Yeah, the so, so the a really good character read, sorry. The Cardassians the Cardassians revere the state as God, which is basically what they've seen. And uh, Ducat is the most um, blasphemous, I guess, that you like. Garrick would be the opposite. Garrick is very um, subservient to the state. Like, all he wants to do is get back to the state. And um, Ducat is a little bit different from that. He's a little bit more of a blasphemer, if you want to look at it in religious terms, where he is willing to. He pays respect to it, but is w- always keeping his eye on it uh, out of the side. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed that they managed to um, create two very different characters in Ducat and Garrick, 
um, while maintaining that that core Cardassian thing of I'm going to help you until it be- doesn't benefit me anymore because they do it in completely different ways. Yeah, yeah. Did did you? I I think that there's some uh, criticism that this episode maybe plays Dukat is too friendly to the Federation. Would either of you agree with that, uh, Darren? If you wanted to speak to that. One of the the recurring issues with Dukat, and I'm wary because I know you guys haven't seen the entire series yet, but one of the criticisms of Dukat as a character is that the show struggles to balance its portrayal of him as a three-dimensional, well-rounded, fully developed uh, character, I I almost said human being, but individual with like his own perspective, his own goals, his own sympathetic point of view. And I think that like the the, the actors and directors have all said that uh, Mark Aliamo, the actor who plays him, like has argued convincingly that Deep Space Nine can be seen as like the heroic story of Gul Dukat and all the people <laughs> who stood in his way. And you kind of get that a lot in how he chooses to play the role. Um, and it, it, it the, the writers are constantly pulling back and forth. And I think that I actually really like the version of Dukat that appears in the kind of in this stretch of the show after his introduction emissary and after in Cardassians where he's this sort of like ominous evil dude who's out to screw everybody in his way starting with the Maquis and then even on into like civil defense which he did shortly before this and into this episode here Dukat is presented as a character who is very clearly self-interested um who is very clearly sort of obsessed with his own position and, and his own image and his own importance and like prioritizes his own safety above absolutely everything else but who at the same time also understands you know that he has a function or a role that he plays in a larger society and that it's important to preserve that so for example in the maquis part one and part two going with cisco into the demilitarized zone and actively trying to stop a war because he understands that a war will benefit nobody in this episode here where he's he's also actively trying to stop a war and also potentially uh trying to stop what may or may not be a coup from the Obsidian Order, because you imagine that's Dukat's motivation there. It's not only interested in preserving the state, he's also kind of concerned at the idea that there's this much power being concentrated somewhere where it shouldn't be, and how that might affect him sort of long term as well. But within that, you have this sort of, also have this sense of Dukat as like a person with his own backstory, like with with his own origin, with his own sort of like sense of perspective on the universe, and his own like, and I don't want to get too, lean too heavily into this before we get there, but his own like needs and desires. Like the sequence... I think that you mentioned it earlier, where he talks to Cisco about his son's 11th birthday mm-hmm. and the difficulty of trying to make time to spend with him and to go and to see the amusements in Lacarian City, which he'd promised to do and he'd always put off, but he said this year will be different. That's a wonderful, like, humanist touch. That's a touch that makes Dukat more than a, a cardboard cutout villain. It makes him feel like a, a fully formed person. And yes. it kind yes. of suggests, yeah, it, it's, it's just, it's a fantastically wonderful touch. But yeah, he's seen... He seems to have, um, and I, I don't, I, I don't know if this is can you can apply this to all the Cardassians because they haven't really expressed it too much. But he almost seems to look at all of these conflicts explicitly as a job. Like he doesn't seem to have that much of a passionate. It's not uh, a Klingon. It's not Klingons yeah. living for the glory of something. Yeah, which is why in this in this case he doesn't go after you know the, he doesn't express anger uh too much uh or there's no scene where he gets in um uh, the obsidian order woman's face about how he was you know gonna go up the chain and and blah 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 blah. he just calmly sees the information that he has to get he gets it and then he keeps it because he can see down the line that all right these guys might to try to take over there's no like there's there's no passion involved if there's passion involved he would demand that the defiant be destroyed and that Tom Riker be killed on the spot. Like he he's just looking at it as how do I move these pieces around in order to keep together my my company basically. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I just I wanted to say one last thing. I love that the the Cardassian government is a delightfully alien little spin on the US system sort of where instead of three branches of checks and balances, the checks and balances are done by <laughs> scheming against each other um, as opposed to sort of checking each other's work, which is a nice little spin on it. It's very Orwellian, um, but I think it works for them. If it was, uh, also, if they were also. doing it now, it would just be anything that Ducat got, he would just leak it to the press. <laughs> Obsidian Order, Deep State. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Deep, Deep State 9. <laughs> But um, actually, funny you should mention Dukat. That's a good joke. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't laugh at that enough. That was a very good joke. Fantastic joke. 
Um, but I do love, um, I actually love when you point out Ducat doing this as a job. One of my favorite understated sequences of the episode is the bit after uh, Riker's done the pull off reveal go tea bit, which is fantastically camp. And it's just, it's cuts to Ducat sitting in the wardroom on Deep Space Nine having a glass of canar with the bottle beside him, while Odo and Sisko work through the finer points of second chances, while Ducat is nonchalant sitting there going, uh, yeah, well, this is a very interesting story that you guys are telling me. Um, what exactly does it have to do with what I'm here for? And you kind of, it reminds me of that joke I think Peter David used to, or I think he actually wrote it into one of his Star Trek novels, but like the idea that in Starfleet, even in Starfleet itself, People look at, like, the logs of James T. Kirk as these sort of, like, tall tales, these tall uh, Paul Bunyan stories about, yeah, sure, Kirk, there was a vampire cloud. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> a, a planet that just happened to have Yanks and Coms on it. What are the odds? But I like the idea of Ducat sitting there going, okay, this is kind of a, this is, this is entertaining. It's like, oh, transporter duplicate, you say. Exact copy, you say. So uh, what exactly am I doing? Oh, oh, he stole a weapon of mass destruction. It would be really fascinating. Scene. It would be really fascinating to see how people uh, back on Earth or in later generations of Starfleet handle all the Shakespeare that shows up in the logs of James D. Kirk. <laughs> <laughs> he had a very. He was obviously had his influences, and he wore them on his sleeve. I guess would be the way to look at Every it. Every planet this guy goes to, there's like hot women in Shakespeare. I don't think he was actually in Starfleet. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kirk just lulling around like just oh I need to file a report just throw uh, Macbeth in there this time I think yeah sure why not yeah the Clay I, and I won't ruin anything for you but most um, of sorry I was just gonna say now that you say that if you explained the plots of most original <laughs> series Star Trek and you did it as though um, you were on that ship and you got back and you explained it to somebody else <laughs> they would think you were so full of shit yeah like even yeah. even in the realm of star trek and aliens and everything starfleet obviously all that stuff exists but half of the stuff where it, it just sounds like an excuse like they're making up a book report or something where it's like yeah so uh you know what happened was spock got real horny and we had to go back to his planet <laughs> And then I had to fight him with a giant axe until until he remembered who I was. It's like, what the hell are you talking about? TOS is the most magical, right? And then you have TNG where it's like, we crashed into a magical space thing, and now we have to go through all the individual stories of people like giving birth and trying to crawl through a tube and stuff like that. T <laughs> TOS is the very magical version of it, where the... Uh, the aliens dress like French generals and stuff when you run into them for no particular... <laughs> just because we, we were... We were uh, filming next to the set of a French Civil War <laughs> documentary or something that was going on. We took There was this points. giant space head. Wouldn't you know, <laughs> it turned out to be a baby. Yeah. W what are the odds? Um, so tell me again about the time you met, uh, met sort of Abraham Lincoln in his space chair. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's, it's like he's in a room looking around at stuff on the wall and just like saying it as, as he's trying to explain <laughs> what happened. Kaiser so said the script. Exactly. I, that's, I, yeah. I mean, it's a... It's an evolution into this series, right? DS9 now feels goofy as hell when they do a TNG version of an episode. Like, TOS is way in the background. They're never going to do a TOS episode. But the TNG influences, even when they are, like, the primary focus of an episode, you're like, this feels a little silly, a little dated at this point. Yeah. Um, but I think this episode just shows you, uh, Clay, you'd, al you'd always called it um, diplomacy. I think I would just augment it. DS9 does political intrigue. Does that make sense? Like it is a, yeah. you called it diplomacy and it was a reason that you never really got into the show because you thought that like, you just be like, oh, it's always going to be diplomacy about these people talking about blah, blah, blah. And it kind of is, but it's more the intrigue, which they're really settling into here. And I don't want to spoil anything, but the, the fleet that they are, uh, the Cardassians are secretly building is going to come back in a couple episodes. So it's not something that should be tossed away. Excellent. Yeah, no, I, I think they do this stuff better. My, predisposition to D DS9 was based entirely off of uh, my memories of TNG, and I don't think TNG does this stuff nearly as well as Deep Space Nine does. And that's because, I mean, you know, it's not really what T TNG was about. Um, Deep Space Nine has the appropriate level of, of grayness to everything going around to make this stuff really interesting. Um, and, you know, it, the serialized nature of it allows you to get more invested in stuff and see how certain decisions in one episode will 
affect something later on down the line and all that kind of let's, stuff. It, let's talk about that, actually. This episode, right, if you had tuned in and were totally unfamiliar with the franchises, this episode mm-hmm. makes no sense Correct. whatsoever, yeah. right? Like this, the, it's surprising how quickly DS9, this isn't even explicitly serialized, but everything they're talking about is something that you kind of need to be familiar with in the periphery. Like you need to know second chances. They give you the rundown of second chances, but if you were unfamiliar, it sounds like they just made it up on the spot. Like mm-hmm. this, is, this is absurd. And you need to be familiar with the uh, state of the Cardassian government at this point. You need to know about Kira's backstory. You know, you need to know about all this stuff. And it's very, um, it's very into its universe at this point in a really interesting way. Could you imagine not having seen any Star Trek starting with this episode and trying to figure out why that guy just took half of his beard off? (laughs) That's how they shave in the future. (laughs) Part of me Uh, thinks, though, that that visual would kind of work just based on, like, and even having not seen Star Trek, knowing that when on Star Trek somebody has a goatee, they are evil. That's true. Um, Yeah. But actually, funny you should mention that in terms of the universe. One of the things I like about the third season of Deep Space Nine is the sense it ties back into like bringing it all back together, the, like the next generation and the relationship to the next generation. Like basically, at the end of the second season, Deep Space Nine got handed the keys to the car uh, with regards to the Star Trek universe because Voyager was always going to be it's going to be over in the Delta Quadrant, nothing to worry about there. Next generation wrapped up, they're going to be doing stuff in the movies, but they're not going to be doing the stuff week to week. So like basically, at this point, like. Deep Space Nine becomes the driving force and it ties into what you're talking about there with the politics it becomes the driving force of the Star Trek universe where everything that happens on Deep Space Nine is allowed to have consequences where they can do stuff like you know just for, for you know not not to, to spoil anything that's coming up but like they could for example topple certain governments kill certain recurring characters now that they wouldn't have the freedom to do in the next generation and there's a sense of that in the third season like you get it at, at the Jem Hadar when they blow up the uh, the Odyssey, which is a galaxy class starship, which is basically mm. like a screw you, Dad, to the next generation. It's like we're in charge now. But even even over the course of the third season, you see them doing stuff like moving pieces across the board and like being able to write stuff involving the Klingons and the Romulans in a more direct way than they could have when the next generation's on the air. And even this episode with its version of Tom Riker, which is you know uniquely Deep Space Nine take on Tom Riker. It's pretty much, it feels like Deep Space Nine is saying, all right, now now Next Generation's over. You know, now everybody's focused on Voyager. We can do our thing. We can be the Star Trek show. We can sort of drive the narrative. We can, all this stuff belongs to us and we can do whatever the hell we want with it, which I kind of like. The, um... Do you think, um, it's a shame that they never did a Mirror episode that have four Rikers in it. <laughs> <laughs> Because that must they, there must be two Rikers in the mirror universe. Yeah, in right? the mirror universe. Yeah, there would have or to be. Unless it's is if it's an exact inverse, maybe there's no Rikers. I don't well, know. in the in the Discovery I, universe, I, Clay Tom Riker is Mirror uh, Riker, who's actually Lorca, who had been turned into a Klingon. Uh, yes. <laughs> so what if it, what if what is what if there's a universe where um, Riker got trapped in that uh, transporter beam? like repeatedly so it just kept spitting out Riker clones so there's an entire there's an entire Starfleet subset of Rikers that's just Well no Rikers. someone someone brought up the good point how was Tom Riker eating he didn't seem to have replicators down there so was he just eating the other replicated Rikers and he's the it's king of the Riker possible. mountain Yeah, yeah. I, you can get into Rick and Morty territory pretty quick with this I want to uh, we go now- now yeah, you gave me the image of like the mirror universe with four Rikers. I'm imagining the mirror version of this episode where Riker hijacks the Defiant and peels off the goatee, revealing just sideburns as the twist <laughs> that he's the good Riker. It doesn't mean anything. It just looks cool as fuck, and that's yeah. uh, that's about yeah, it. Yeah, he's just the Wolverine mutton chop. <laughs> I want to um, I have one. I want to talk about the ending briefly. I just want to say one thing that mi- I'm sorry. Now I'm thinking of every version of Riker has a different style of facial hair (laughs) like one of them has the sideburns that goes into the mustache like lemmy from motorhead the fu manchu that he keeps stroking as he's thinking about what he's gonna do this is Uh, but all of them have to be concealed with prosthetics so he can peel them off as a dramatic (laughs) reveal Uh. (laughs) the i want to talk about the ending but before we get to that i want to bring up something that i was kind of shocked and maybe it's just my modern take on how movies and everything work together I, I think I'm right about saying this. This episode aired three days before Generations came out. So doesn't that seem like in today's age they would be hypersensitive to not having Riker show up before the Enterprise had been destroyed? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. 
part of me wonders if this wasn't like a corporate mandated crossover, because not to spoil too much that's coming up, there's another recurring Next Generation character who will be appearing in about an episode or two as well. And they all seem congregated around the release of Generations. And part of me wonders if this wasn't Deep Space Nine's writing staff going, oh, you want a Riker episode? We'll give you a Riker episode. Yeah, right, that, right. Sounds, um, that sounds right to me. <clears throat> that sounds... Um, yeah, because they did the same thing with Spock on TNG, where he came. He was on the show right around the time Star Trek VI came out, right? Yeah, one yeah. of the movies. Yep, yep. Yeah, so I think it's. I think it's probably the. Uh, hey, remember this guy? There's a movie coming out. You know, it's like having somebody on to plug something. Do you think Star Trek underserved the crossover of the universes, or did they do it the right amount or too much? Uh, Star Trek as a whole. As a whole, across all the franchises. I think it. Depends on the show. Well, because I, you know, uh, Darren, I was going to say when you were talking about Discovery, not that we need to open this can of worms, but uh, um, and <laughs> we'll shows, stop recording shows and we'll being start uh, shows being too deferential to to TNG. I think Discovery could be better served as being if they had been ref, referential to TNG than the original series. Uh, I mean, that's the one thing we we had talked about consistently is if they had just put the show into the future, um, it would have it would have freed them up so much and also had given them stuff to fall back on that didn't feel so much of like a cheat. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it's, you know, I, I think overall from what I've seen, I think they do it pretty well. If I had to, if I had to say so, yeah, I think they do a pretty good job of it. Um, I, I think it's the right amount. They, I, I don't know if Darren, if you had written this or I saw it somewhere else, but uh, no, they never do a Marvel DC crossover event. You know what I mean? They never have like, here's the entire fucking crew going to meet the DS9 crew and we're going to go off and do something together. They never have that level of an event of a crossover. You so say that like you would not love that. <laughs> I would I, I would love it, I think. It would have to be right. It couldn't be the worst story. It, it couldn't be like a unification episode because the unification was terrible. But if they did it in the right way, I think it would have been pretty awesome. Maybe even for a movie or something to do that, but who knows? Yeah. I mean, I've there's also... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I've always appreciated the way that they handle it because they do it enough to to reinforce that it's all the same universe and to keep get you excited about seeing other people, but they don't never do it to the point where it overshadows the show that you're watching, well, with the exception of Enterprise, but um, m more or less they do it in service of, of the universe, the Star Trek universe as a whole, which I think is, is, is difficult to do because uh, it requires restraint. But if you can do it, it's it's always a benefit. Let's uh, let's talk about the ending briefly, and then we'll hurry up and call this a day. But Clay, you didn't like the ending. Explain. I wouldn't say I didn't like it. It was you know I think it's just a matter of uh, even though there was a fair amount of space battle in this, it's another one where it's a lot of people looking at a screen, you know, um, and stuff happening off camera. It's the best and, case version of that story. Yeah, it is. It's the best case version of that. And I think the thing that bothered me about it, it, it just seemed like at the end of the story, it was um, your son stole the car and then drove down to the edge of the street and then decided to turn around and come home. And then you know got I mean? tortured to death. Yeah, then got tortured to death. Not to death. <laughs> Sentenced to, to slavery. Not to death. Yeah. He's sent, sent to his room for the rest of his life. <laughs> Where he has to break big rocks into smaller rocks. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, I don't know. It was just, it seemed, I don't really know. I don't, it's, maybe it's not even a, a valid criticism of it, but it was just seemed like, uh, I mean, I, I guess it works in, 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 the, in the context of what they were doing, but I guess it was just that it was, they're driving towards this sort, certain goal, and then they're just kind of like, eh, let's not do this, and they kind of go back. And again, that, maybe that's completely unfair. It just, it didn't, it didn't really land with me as a, as, as a, as a really strong endpoint. But I mean, that's... character character-wise, I'm totally into it. Um, sending R Riker away to the the salt uh, salt mines or whatever is is very uh, very dark. Yeah, um, yeah. and it just I, I guess some of it just wrapped up too cleanly, you know. Because I'm not, it was just I'm not like, going to. Sorry, I, I'm not going to say you're wrong, um, but I'll I'll say that because 
It's because obviously your perspective is this as an episode. I think this is one of those cases like when you uh, you had talked in the search, you're like, maybe I need to give the show more credit. This is kind of a weird, bizarro version of that where in a couple episodes, what happens here is going to make more sense of okay. things. All like, right. And I, I don't know if they they wrote this episode knowing what they were going to do in a couple episodes. They didn't. So it's a retcon that works and I'm looking at it through retcon glasses and you're appropriately looking at it as not retcon glasses. So you're, you're more accurate, but I will say that um, just to, to remember this episode, I suppose. Yeah. I think it's just, I think it's just for me, the ease at which it all wraps up right at the end where it's like, okay, I'll stop. I'll go back to this ship. All right. Now the ship's under the, 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 the shields of the Cardassian ship. All right. You, I'm going to beam off. All right, Kira, take the keys, drive the car back to the house. You know, it, you know it, it's, the, it's just a yeah. little bit too e- too easy, but I understand it's the end of the episode. You got to wrap things up. I hated the kiss because he's not Will Riker. Yeah. That's the part I hated, <laughs> although he is Will well, Riker. Also, the, the weird bit where Kira's like, I will come and I will find you. Don't yeah, give up weird. hope. Yeah, that part and was weird. And then the kiss. Remember that time you kidnapped me, locked me on the ship, uh, almost caused a war, good times. Yeah, and I also... Like also, I don't know who you are. Um, you know, <laughs> false pretenses. The uh, I, I love. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I love the idea that this is all Kira's day off. Like that, you're, <laughs> we're looking at this from the wrong perspective. That like we shouldn't be looking at this as like a Tom Riker story or a Cardassian politics story. This is just Kira blowing off some steam as the episode originally opens. It's like uh, you know, at the and at the end, she sort of ends her like romantic pirate space pirate. Uh, hollow novel and it's like wow that was relaxing oh i was Um, just gonna say what happens if the next episode they're like kira that was a crazy holodeck program you plugged in there tom Riker isn't a real thing he doesn't exist (laughs) i I was gonna say though i i actually i actually liked the kiss um only because i actually thought it made sense for Riker because he's about to go he's about to go to a (laughs) prison labor camp for the rest of his life and there is a woman standing in front of him I would assume he's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would assume he's probably going to get one last kiss in before he, you know, goes to prison for the rest of I, his life. Here's my problem with it. I, I still, it's that problem of us being able to watch Tom Riker and not recognize him as Will Riker, who lived a different life. Like he, the kiss makes sense because he is Riker, and Tom Riker should also do that. However, I thought they had, the point of the episode was kind of a differentiation there where Tom Riker is different from Will Riker and I would have rather him not kiss her, maybe a handshake or something weird. But the <laughs> the problem, I think the my problem with the ending and how abrupt it is, is that I feel the episode spent almost too much time with Cisco and Dukat and I was more interested in the internal identity of Tom Riker than anything mm. and they never really break down what tom Riker thinks about things he's just kind of there i think that's part of it for me too but in a in a different sense that they spend a lot of time with cisco and ducat because that's where basically the the action of the episode lies and i don't mean that like in boom bang guns and stuff i mean just like the actual forward momentum of the episode lies with them if you th- if you think about what's going on on the the tom Riker side they're basically just flying around in empty space. Yeah. Um, so I can see why they spent their time with Ducat and Cisco, and I think that's what bothers me a little bit is when it's like, well, when you when you just look at what Riker did, he just kind of flew around. I guess he blew up that one space station or something, but we didn't get to see that. Um, yeah, and it just feels a little bit flat as far as bringing him in, putting him in the situation where you're going to uh, um, analyze who this person is and who he wants to be and what a Starfleet commander's uh, approach to this terrorist organization would be from the inside and have all these sort of ethical debates. And then you don't really spend a lot of time doing that. So I can definitely, I would definitely agree with you that I wish they had done more with him. All right. Well, we're going to wrap it up there. I'm going to take a break. We are going to play another audio clip. We'll come back. We'll give our final thoughts. We'll read some patron thoughts and then we'll call it a day. The cut. Hmm? Are you listening to me? Oh, I'm sorry, Commander. I was thinking about my son's birthday. Really? Yes. Today is his 11th birthday. I promised to take him to the amusement center in Lakarian City. He always wanted to go. But I never had the time. 
I told him, this year will be different, Mikor. This year, I will make the time. I had the same experience with Jake. At that age, they never understand, do they? You just hope that one day later they'll look back and say, Now I understand. Now I know why he did that. When my son looks back on this day, the only thing he'll remember is that a Federation officer on a Federation ship invaded his home and kept his father away from him on his 11th birthday. And he won't look back with understanding. He'll look back with hatred. And that's sad. All right, so if you support the show on patreon.com slash the Penske file, you get to leave your thoughts about upcoming episodes and we read them on the podcast and we react to them. Zam Nuclear Wessel writes, Defiant shows nicely how an app can be a fun romp and advance the overplot at the same time. DS9 doesn't always get the balance exactly right, but when it does, it's great. Uh, Stephen Cobb says, Defiant, this had some good writing. The hijacking was well done. The interaction with Cisco and Ducat and subsequent Obsidian Order thing was good. The ending was a bit cheesy, felt like Teen G to me, but then having Riker could be skewing my perception. The scene where like, Riker pulls off his extra facial hair and a sinister reveal is the lamest villain reveal ever. Uh, Christian Pouch. I kind of re- love it. <laughs> <laughs> I like it on a, I like it as a fan of the franchise. I think if I was, I think if I was unfamiliar with the franchise, I would have been like, what the, what the hell was that? Like, yeah. that was just a it bizarre It required buy-in. Yes. Yeah, 100%. Christian Pouch writes, Defiant, well, I don't think this is Frakes' best work. It's still fun to see him on DS9. Of course, it makes sense that he's immediately popular and works his way onto the Defiant easily. On the other hand, the other Maquis are forgettable background extras and have no input to the story. The, their vests are very memorable, uh, Christian. I will <laughs> I will argue about it. Anytime people show up with vests, you have to remember it. The are, other they the, highlight- are they the first, like, gang or terrorist organization that have chosen, like, Paisley as their color? <laughs> It seems incredibly popular. It's like the, um, I'm watching a lot of Queer Eye on Netflix now, and the fashion guy's advice is basically get a shirt with a flower print on it, and I think that that translates into, like, the Maquis sensibility of style. Um, the other highlight is Ducat and Cisco working together and eventually working against the Obsidian Order and setting up events to come. Dun, dun, dun. But really, DS9 needs to get better security measures for its ships. I disagree, right? He found the perfect way to get around the security system of the Defiant, right? And... The Defiant seems much more secure than it does in literally any other episode. Right. Like, I can't remember mm. any of the other episodes where the crew are wandering onto or off of the Defiant going, oh, well, I guess I have to do a palm print thing now. Um, so, when, yeah, I kind of... Sorry, yeah, go ahead. When, well, when Worf shows up, he just sleeps on it. So he's just, like, walking <laughs> on, and off, on and off of it. So yeah. who, who he knows? He sits on the bridge in his spare time, if I recall, like, sharpening <laughs> his blade and listening to Klingon opera. I feel like the Defiant is plenty secure in Season 3, um, less so as it goes on. Matthew Ross, Defiant, interesting tie-in with Tom Riker. Was this because Frakes needed some cash? What, uh, whatever, it was mildly plausible, but you think that the Federation would be able to have some sort of way to differentiate the two Rikers. The stealing of the Defiant, pretty standard fakery. Ask the Binars from Season 1 of TNG. The subplot of the Obsidian Order was mildly interesting in that it sets up for later stories, but rather blah here. It was menacing when there were two sets of Cardis facing off. Uh, Ducat's story about a missed birthday party seems convincing. Yeah, that's the... Do, uh, just quickly, do we all believe Ducat's story about the birthday party? Um, well, it doesn't involve him directly, so I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt on this. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about that. I don't see... I, I don't know why him telling that story would benefit him. Yeah. You know, because he, he doesn't really use that leverage against Cisco. If anything, Cisco uses it against him. Yeah, my I, I think my only problem is on a technical level, the scene where he brings it up is so out of nowhere that it feels like it's like a fake story. Because Cisco's like, my God, we can't find this ship. We're scanning sectors. And Ducat, are you listening? He says, no, I'm thinking about my son's birthday party. And it's just kind of, it's like a, an odd uh, an odd sort of split from the storyline. Uh, Zam Nuclear Wessel writes There's again. There's Ducat phoning it in professionally speaking. <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, this is just my lazy Saturday. 
It's like, no, I'm sorry. I was thinking about fishing, actually. Um, uh, sorry, well, I, I think that giant guy, weapon flying through space. I think that guy had been ordered to lock the uh, that panel, too, so Dukat couldn't play, like, Minesweeper or something as Cisco was talking to him. <laughs> uh, Zam Nuclear Wessel adds, Defiant forgot to mention one cute point. Thomas Riker's line in t- uh, line, Tough Little Ship, on first seeing the Defiant, is the exact same line William Riker later gives when he sees it in first contact, which is true. Oh. It is a tough little ship. So... First contact Riker by that line of reasoning is actually Tom Riker. Yes, who is Mirror Lorca, who was yep. a Klingon. Uh, who def- is one of five to possibly unlimited number of Rikers. <laughs> That's the title of my memoir, Unlimited Rikers. Um, Holly, Just when you someone's... go back there and mention the sort of difficulty distinguishing between Rikers, part of me now likes to imagine that like after Second Chances ending, ended, Starfleet were like, we need a way to distinguish the Rikers. So can you just destroy the hair follicles between his locks and his goatee? I... And they're like, yep, yeah, perfect. This is foolproof. They will never confuse the Rikers again. And Riker's I imagine like, them, uh, th- them standing shoulder to shoulder and like the camera's got the ba- their backs and they're looking forward and an admiral is pacing back and forth between them and then he stops and just pauses and takes a clipper and just shaves one of them's <laughs> face and is like, you, you are Tom Riker. <laughs> Um, I, I think uh, someone's someone's fan fiction website probably just got a big boost from this concept of unlimited Rikers. <laughs> but let's let's be honest. I'm sure that Jonathan Frakes has already written that story. Holly uh, Holly McLaughlin writes defiant Tom. I love Tom. Though surely a sentence of death would be more merciful than what Cisco negotiated for him having to endure. I wondered that too. Would you rather be dead or would you rather serve as a slave in a labor camp for the rest of your life? That's, I, I think, I was thinking about that too. It's like, it, it all, I mean, I guess it, it makes sense because of the other people on the ship and everything, but I, I was just assuming he was going to like beam Kira off or something or and then take the ship in himself or something. Because if that was me, I'd be like, uh, all right, how about I beam you guys out of here and I'd take the <laughs> hero's death. <laughs> right. And, uh, Clay, just so you know, Tom Riker does not come back. Does, oh, that change, does that change anything for you? Yeah, it makes me disappointed. I think it would, I, it would be... I think he's a... It's a bummer that they didn't keep him around. I understand. I think that, the that's the only reason to keep him so. alive. You know, if you keep him alive, it's because you want to go back to him. Apparently... In season four, Tom Riker was one of the stories that the writing staff said, you can't pitch us a story about Tom Riker. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah, they, just, they yeah. didn't want to deal with they it. They had infinite Rikers, unfortunately. Yeah, right. Riker <laughs> what about Jerry Riker? Um, I, was, I was just going to say, Tom is like the most blah name they could have picked. Like if it Dave, it was Dave Riker. <laughs> Dick Riker. <laughs> well, Dick would actually work in that as some sort of uh, symbolic <laughs> level. Um Let's see here. That's pretty much it. Thank you guys for commenting. Thank you for being patrons. If you guys want to support the show, go to patreon.com slash the Penske file. You support the show there. A couple dollars a month, you get extra podcasts and you can leave comments, blah, blah, blah. Thank you for listening, everybody. So now, Darren, we rate the episodes on a scale of one to five. I think you you might not do, be into uh, rating episodes, but God damn it, you're on this show. You're going to rate this episode. Um, one is terrible. Five is perfect. And where do you think this episode would stand for yourself on that scale? Can I give it half 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 star rating? You can, yeah. I think Clay has gone to like seven decimal points at some point, so you're allowed to. Okay, I'll go with a three point five then. Three point five, Clay. Yeah, I would probably say the same. I was gonna say four, um, but I don't know. I mean, it's good. I don't think it's great. Yeah. However, that being said, if this episode had just been Riker and Jake Cisco vying back and forth for the affection of a Dabo girl, then this would be a, a hot five for me. Cisco has clearly got that Dabo girl on his mind. It's the first thing he brings up when he meets, uh, when he meets somebody from Starfleet. He's like, my, my son's a, you know, nailing a Dabo girl. Yeah. Just thought, you know, just I, you know, and I'm not entirely joking. Like, I know we joked about, oh, oh you know, they're playing and blah, blah, blah. If they had done an episode where that was the... the, the uh, the the plot, I bet that would be a fan favorite, and that would have been a great episode. Um, you may want to look forward to something around the midpoint of season five, where they do have another crossover episode where a guest star from another series competes for the affection of a Dabo girl. Now we're you talking. You get exactly what you're asking. Now for. we're talking. Clay, w- when we we spent the the, or I forget what, what even episode that was, when we were talking about the Dabo Wait, girl. Is it, Jake. is it Jake Sisko competing for the affection of a Dabo girl with the ghost of Tasha Yar? Because I'm, I'm here I like for this. that. We should just do Mad Libs. Yeah, it's like, yeah, we're all over this. The 
I, I thought it was funny. The feed, the most feedback we got about when we talked about and ranted about the Jake Sisko dating the Dabo girl thing was uh, people Googling the actress's real age and telling me that it was appropriate <laughs> that they, they should dance. <laughs> Yeah, did we did we ever figure out what the what her actual age was? She's she's eighteen, I think, in real life. Like that seems at that remarkably point? at that point. I think in the actress at that point was eighteen, which is shocking to me. Like shocking that she's wow. eighteen. All right. Oh, so I, I just wanted to to, uh, to say something else. Is t- the fate of Tom Riker more or less um, uh, tragic than the fate of Tasha Yar, who lest we forget that's true yeah gets okay. saved from being killed by the muck monster in order to go <laughs> back in time and be imprisoned on rom on romulus and be a concubine yes <laughs> and then eventually yeah. be murdered later <laughs> well, murdered as a result of her daughter as well just yes. to make it yeah. extra yeah yeah i think you're right clay i think tasha is actually more uh tragic than tom Riker. Although they're both fairly tragic, in my opinion. Yeah, that's a, that's a good those, thought. Those two kids should pretty get Pretty dark for the Connecticut of the Star Trek universe, in hindsight, actually, now that, yeah. uh, now that I think well, about it. Well, even Connecticut has a new London. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there there is, um, Fall River is right across the border from Connecticut. Yeah, I actually, so, you know? new London is probably very nice. I was just the first <laughs> one that popped into my head. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we, live, we, uh, we live near Connecticut, and apparently we just can't, um, we can't think of an actually terrible part of of Connecticut, so maybe all that is I know, an extra statement. All I know is that anytime you go to New York, you drive through Connecticut for like, it seems like eight hours, even though yes, it only yes. takes four hours to get to New York. The 84. 84 is the worst highway in the world, and you have to go that way to get to New York. At least that's the way I go, and it's terrible. Mm-hmm. So, guys, thank you very much for listening. Thank you for supporting the show. Patreon.com slash the Penske file. All the social media links will be there. Oh, no, I'm going to give this What are you going to rate it? You didn't I'm rate gonna, it. I'm going to give it, I don't, I don't do the half numbers. I think I'm going to have to give this one a three. Yeah. Um, although I think it's a strong three, so take that for what you will. I don't, I think this is a pretty enjoyable episode to watch. I just don't know if it really is that exceptional in and of itself. I think it's just a solid episode of the show. I, Much I, like Tom Riker himself. Right, exactly. <laughs> I feel like my expectations were a little bit high on this one because I do remember people really looking forward to me seeing this one. And usually that's in response to me kind of being waffling about the series as a whole. And it's usually like, well, wait till you get to that one and then that'll change your mind. So I was expecting big things from, from Riker on Deep Space Nine and I was a little bit let down. So Yeah, yeah. I know. think it's a, yeah, it's one of those, the story is better than the execution on a little bit of a, a level, mm-hmm. I think. Like the idea is really effective. I just don't know if it pulls it off super well. Um, let's see. Social media links, all that stuff. We have new episodes coming up every Monday and Thursday. All that jazz. Darren, thanks for coming on. Thank you very much for having me, guys. Clay, thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. And we will be back, but that's about it. You can check out all the links. I'll put Darren's links down below, and then we can check out Clay's stuff. All that jazz. Thank you guys very much for listening, and we will see you next time.